This presentation was recorded at the 2015 Gold Coast ANZIC Safety and Quality Conference on Deteriorating Patients. Thank you, Liz, and uh, thank you to Daryl for inviting me. I, I see that he gets to uh, let me talk about the practical issues. I obviously can't read the literature, so it's really a, a hands-on, what do we do at the situation? Well, perhaps I just really put some context into where end-of-life interfaces with intensive care and the MET system. So one of the challenges, if I can get this thing to work, no, Let's see. Yep. is that we actually can do anything that we like in intensive care and potentially improve the outcome of uh, many patients. And indeed, over my lengthy lifetime, I have seen the outcome of intensive care patients improve. So the bigger question is, you know, who actually is helped by intensive care and who is not? And that becomes a very pointy question. So it's to ICU or not to ICU, said Watson. And the challenge for us is that the interface between the patients on the ward and intensive care has increased. So, for example, in Canberra, uh, we have seen an increase in the number of intensive care patients uh, rise from 1,000 to 2,000 in 15 years. But at the same time, so has the number of patients seen by the MET system gone from, say, 400 years, 400, years, 400 patients, feels like it, um, 400 patients... Uh, when we first set out with the merit, and then, you know, 2014, we had 2,000 patients seen by the MET system. So all up, we've got about 3,500 patients that has an interface with intensive care. And, and, of course, the question then becomes increasingly, should they be admitted to intensive care unit, let alone have we actually got a bed? So I'm sure none of you will be familiar with these sort of stories. Um, so, you know, the 90-year-old, no end-of-life discussion, despite the fact that they've reached 90. And actually, interestingly, the previous speaker talked about the, the very good 80-year-old. And I would say that in the last 20 years, that's exactly what's come to me, you know, oh, this very good 80-year-old. You know what? In the last year, it's been this very good 90-year-old. So, you know, in, again, in my lifetime, I've seen that change. So the 90-year-old with a disseminated uh, carcinoma and no end-of-life discussion and then has a cardiac arrest. Uh, then the 76-year-old patient who's admitted for presumably palliative dobutamine in end-stage heart failure and really asking the question whether they could come to intensive care for them to have longer to make the decision of whether this is appropriate or not. It's curious why that could not have happened in the coronary care unit. And then, you know, it's a tragic case, 53-year-old with disseminated melanoma, uh, not for resuscitation, but still for MET calls. And again, I'm sure uh, you are, none of you are familiar with this, as this really a Canberra problem. So the interesting thing is, I suspecting that uh, although we think that a lot of patients who die in hospital are exposed to intensive care before they die, and in our organization it's about a third, but increasingly patients who die uh, in the hospital are now exposed to the MET system uh, almost sometimes instead of. So again, there's still that interface of making the decision whether they should or shouldn't be coming to intensive care. And so... Uh, the problem with that is that when you're looking at patients dying in hospital, and although these are old data, I think if we were to do this again and looking back at patients who die in hospital, is that probably if you were to ask the patients and families, this is not a good experience. So what we're delivering is maybe improving, say, the outcome, hospital outcome, but are we actually improving the actual experience of patients having in hospital? And those that die about uh, at least 88% of them are at least getting an NFR before they die, but only half of them are being made you know, longer than a day out from when they actually die. So again, I would suggest to you that the way patients are dying in hospital right now is not the best that we could possibly offer. And what role does the MET system have in this? Can we actually make it better? So when... Why the MET is getting involved in this is, as Ken very nicely pointed out, that those that die, those that go to intensive care, have physiological deterioration. So they automatically trigger the physiological response, and that is to call a MET system. So that's how we've got muddled up into this whole uh, exercise. And so, as, as previously pointed out, at least in, in some organizations, a third of METs are all around uh, end-of-life discussions, and some are even triggering new end-of-life treatment limitations. 
And of course, you can pick out those patients that are at risk of undergoing these thought processes. And it's obviously the frail, the older, the, with the chronic diseases and if they've been in hospital for one week. And indeed, I was only recently at a conference in Canada when they talked about frailty. If you admit a patient onto the ward and their mobility and they can't move around the bed gets worse over 48 hours, that's probably better than the Apache risk of death that they are likely to die. So if you ever see a patient and they haven't moved for two days, they're not going to do well, obviously not in intensive care nurse. Um, challenge, of course, is that 50% you know, of these patients who have end-of-life issues may in fact go home. So you've just got to be careful that you're picking the right patients. Now, this is, these are data from Canberra, which I think, for me, was quite interesting when I was plotting out. So if you look at the red line, these are patients that we are being called to over time that already had a not for resuscitation order. So someone somewhere on the ward have made a decision they're not for resuscitation. What they haven't yet done is made the call that they're not for a MET call. They haven't quite finalized that this is now a patient for comfort care only. So in some respects, you can see in Canberra, they are at least making thought processes towards end of life, but not quite making it to the point that they're not being called for an intensive care review, which of course is the MET system. And indeed, the not for resuscitation down over time is going uh, down. So we're actually making it before, or rather the wards are making it before we get called and less afterwards, which I thought was quite interesting. So it has been a change of behavior, which only just needs to be nudged the next step so that we don't seem to get involved quite so much in end-of-life care. So why is this, as I say, all relevant to us? Well, firstly, we're getting involved in this because we're being triggered to see these sorts of patients. But the important part of it is that these discussions, these end-of-life discussions that we get muddled up into are more common than it is for, say, cardiac arrest. And yet, we train our medical students, we train our junior doctors that they must have advanced life support. And yet, it's less frequent than it is when uh, we're talking of end-of-life conversations. So in some respects, you can sit, sit, start to see that our education is slightly skewed, perhaps, to the wrong end. Um, and so, of course, we need training and communication. And, of course, the other challenge is that, you know, because we operate hospitals only 30% in hours and 70% out of hours, that it's landing up with the registrars uh, who probably uh, are less experienced uh, who are having to manage these conversations. And so uh, it is important to get this right because if we get it right, then at least these patients may not be burdened with having an intensive care experience, which may not be appropriate. So, of course, it's important when you reach a patient who may have end-of-life issues is that you need to work out whether, in fact, the patient has had a goals of care conversation or an end-of-life care conversation. It is likely that these patients are, uh, have a higher risk of hospital mortality and less likely to benefit from intensive care. So it's important to wheel out who these patients are before you then start to get excited around other issues around the MET. And so important pieces of information that when you reach the MET is obviously not only to establish whether the patient has had a, a goals of care conversation, but also trying to get some sort of pre-morbid history, if it's possible, from uh, the patient's family or indeed the ward nurses. I mean, only the other day I was called to see a patient. And when you ask the nurses how was this patient uh, before hospital, well, you know, they were in a nursing home and had to have full care and now was having to be fed by the nurses. And they just, even by that knowledge, you can start to think this patient is not going to do well. And so you need to understand what they were like beforehand and what their preferences were. And also, how well have they done during their hospital stay? Because, of course, the longer that they're in hospital, the longer that they're do doing less well, the more likely they are not going to benefit from an intensive care admission or, indeed, curative treatment. And, of course, once one has made the decision, it's important to talk with the patient uh, obviously you'll be talking with them all the time and indeed with the family. Importantly, you must talk to the ward team uh, and the treating consultant um, uh, before making any final decision. So 
That's sort of in a broad concept of one, what one might do. But if we then break it down into sort of three scenarios of how we get involved in patients uh, when we are called as a medical emergency team. So the first scenario, if you like, is the easy scenario. That is that there are no limitations in place. We believe that there should be no limitations in place in terms of treatment. Uh, it's not re remotely related to end of life, and that's obviously in 70% of uh, situation or higher. Uh, and that you are intending curative intent, or rather that you are intending that they will go home and that they are likely to benefit from intensive care. So, you know, of the 2,000 MET calls that we will have in Canberra, between 20 and 25 percent will be admitted to the intensive care unit. So, in effect, we're very much operating as an acute medical team uh, rather than an intensive care team. The second scenario, I'm sure, again, you don't really have. I mean, how many of you have been called to a MET uh, that's a cardiac arrest and actually has the sticker in not for resuscitation, i.e. jumping on their chest? Anyone ever had that scenario? So obviously, you know, much better than we are in Canberra. So certainly we do get called. They fail to see the pink sticker and uh, suddenly we're starting to jump on the chest. And then it's articulated, well, actually, no, 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 hang on a minute. This is not appropriate. So you have to untangle the mess that you've just made yourselves into and withdraw. But obviously trying to reassure the home team at the time and particularly the ward nurses that this is the right thing to do, that you don't need to be so actively involved and, uh, you know, and... Uh, so that the patient can have comfort care or be allowed to die in peace. The, the third scenario, I think, is probably the, the most tricky scenario, and this is where eye-rolling is important not to happen. <laughs> So I'm always accused of eye-rolling. I find it very difficult when you, you know, you don't even have to walk into the room, but you can see the toes. The toes look bad. They're sort of very pale, very frail, and you know that there's just that sinking feeling that this is not the right place for you, or indeed the patient. And so uh, if you are, have a, a tendency to eye rolling, I would suggest that you leave others to do at least the frontline bit, and that you stay back, and you can do your eye rolling quietly elsewhere. So you arrive at the patient, where really there's a very unclear documentation as to what should happen. So on the one hand, the story will be you know, palliative chemotherapy, uh, radiation therapy, uh, or that they've honestly got end-stage heart failure, and there is nothing more that you can do, but someone somewhere has not had that conversation that they will not benefit from intensive care. And I think that's always the challenge is to move ward doctors from, it's all very well now, but what are we actually trying to achieve in the end? What is it? So again, I go back to this patient where the nurses were now having to feed the patient. He was only in his mid-60s. But he had a cancer, but they didn't quite know whether this was the same cancer they had before or a different one. But whatever it was, it was definitely fixable. But the trouble is that what they weren't looking at was the whole picture. And really, it was the whole picture that mattered. So the challenge, of course, is you go in, you are thinking that this patient is unlikely to benefit from intensive care or indeed benefit from intensive care on the ward. That is the MET system. So you, there's doubt from the home team because you're uncertain about the diagnosis, as I just uh, relayed a story, or uncertain of the stage of the disease. Uh, and there may also be disagreement between the nurses and the doctors on the ward. There also may be dis disagreement between the family and the doctors. And now we've got some uh, challenge between intensive care and the ward as well. So there's all sorts of reasons why the pathway may not be clear. So as I say, there's, uh, the, often there's uh, disagreements and it's whether you know, the family are thinking that this is curative therapy uh, because they've been told that they can get another two or three months, but that's not really curative. Uh, and indeed, um, the challenge always about chronic disease is that when they suddenly, suddenly, over the last 15 years, their lung condition has got worse. <laughs> So you're trying to extend the story out. Well, actually, you know, 15 years ago they were running a, a marathon, but now they're confined to one room. So it's trying to paint, again, the whole picture. This is not a sudden deterioration. 
And so what one needs to do if you're really in a, in a pickle is that you have to uh, sustain the patient from an ABC point of view while someone somewhere goes to sort out how you're going to manage the next few steps. And, then, and sometimes that does mean that you have to bring them to the intensive care unit because you cannot reach consensus. I guess you know, maybe I'm too soft, but I think it's very difficult when you've got conflict with the family or conflict with the admitting uh, ward specialists that you can't sort it out at the bed. So sometimes there's a staging that you do bring them to the intensive care unit while you try and sort out what is going on. Importantly, and I guess this is where I think it's important to talk to the treating consultant as well as to the, uh, the family and the patient if they're actually conscious enough to have a dialogue. It's important to work out from the beginning what the patient has had going on, what the likelihood is of cure, or at least to go home. And so directly speaking to the consultant concern, and not Chinese whispers, as is often the case. And so you can have a direct conversation to work out a, a plan that then is also uh, articulated with the family and the patient. Uh, I think if you're a junior intensive care registrar, I think it's important to involve the intensive care consultant to get some sort of sense of whether they believe what you're doing is appropriate or not. And I think with all these pieces of information from the family, from the treating consultant and the intensive care consultant, then you can work a very clear plan ahead of, of what it is that you're trying to do. Are you trying to get the patient home? Is this patient gain a benefit from intensive care? And if not, then you start to communicate that actually this patient uh, should be for comfort care and should be uh, made not for the MET call. And I think, I don't know what others are finding, but I find ward consultants are very reluctant to write not for further MET calls. It's that next step that is not happening when uh, we believe that's probably not the best thing for the patient. And as been mentioned before, the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality has launched this recent end-of-life consensus statement whereby it describes, if you like, the gold standard of how we should manage patients who are dying in hospital. That is, we recognize them in a timely fashion, we allow them to articulate their goals of care, and that we then provide the care during their dying days uh, as appropriately as possible. And if we were to follow this, then I think we would find that both patients and families have a much better experience. So uh, this is likely to be implemented, although it's released now, the Commission are now trying to develop some tools to facilitate its implementation so that you who are having to deal with end-of-life conversations, hopefully the ward consultants can start to sense that what we're doing right now in hospital is not appropriate for dying patients in many, many organisations and surely we can make it better. So really, just to sum up, I think you know, we need to recognize that uh, whether we like it or not, the MET system or the rapid response team system is actively involved in end-of-life care issues because of the physiological trigger that is so common when we are dying. The challenge that we have is that we often put people into these situations that have inadequate training. So we train them very well for advanced life support, but in our system, that's only 4% of calls whereas 20 to 30% of calls are actually around end of life and having that conversation. So we need to be much more active in this area. Uh, and I think that's uh, certainly a way forward. Or indeed, the way forward is that many, many more patients are actually allowed to die at home.